Welcome to How the Song Came to Be, where soulful songwriters share the stories behind their songs, as well as tools and creative practices you can use to bring your best songs or other creative works to life. I'm Ann Heaton, your host. And he played solo, and I just never seen anyone bring that kind of rock and roll energy to a solo performance. Mm. And I'm not talking about bashing on his guitar at all. I'm not talking about jumping up and down and yelling. I'm talking about playing quietly, but with extraordinary power, or at least oh, power wow. that I hadn't seen before. Wow. And that that night, I was with a friend. It had the same effect on my friend, where it just really it showed me what the music that I wanted to play was. Welcome to How the Song Came to Be. I'm Ann Heaton, your host. Today's guest is Bob Hillman, a San Francisco singer-songwriter who is well into the second act of a career that began in the late 1990s in New York City, where he fell in with Jack Hardy's long-running songwriting group, which met every Monday night in Greenwich Village to eat pasta and share new songs. Bob's career flourished in the early thousands, then survived 10 years of real jobs and resumed in 2016. Bob's most recent full-length album was released in April 2019, Some of Us Are Free, Some of Us Are Lost. Bob has toured extensively with Suzanne Vega, playing venues like the Fillmore Auditorium and Bowery Ballroom. Most recently, Bob wrote and recorded Inside and Terrified, a five-song EP written during and about the COVID-19 lockdown. Bob, welcome to the show. So good to see you. Thank you. You You too. Yay. I'm so happy you're here. This is really fun. Um, So we had a little bit of an email exchange and an exchange just now, and I'm really excited to kind of dive into uh, especially what you raised about um, the theme of empowerment around being an artist. But before we get into all of that and your new EP, I'd like to start the way we usually do, which is just to ask you what compelled you to start writing songs in the beginning? Like, what was it? I had a strong compulsion. Um, from, uh, from my very, very early years, I was interested in musical instruments, you know, bagging on the piano in my grandma's house. I took piano lessons. I took drum lessons after that. Mm-hmm. I took guitar lessons after that. But I was never the kind of guy who practiced, uh, you know, like you would practice to be in Van Halen, let's say. I <laughs> for example. sat around, you know, for example, I sat around playing songs. I was always a song guy. Yeah. You know, and in my high school years that had a lot to do with classic rock and the Grateful Dead and those kind of great songs from those catalogs. Um, but when I was an avid reader of the LA Times calendar section, having grown up in Los Angeles, huh. and there was a critic there named Robert Hilburn who was whose name is very similar to my own, by the way, but also uh, more relevantly uh, had great taste in music from my perspective. And he was on top of the, uh, you know, like 10,000 Maniacs and REM, and he was really into U2 pretty early on. And so I tended to take his recommendations. And when uh, Peter Case from the Plimsolls, who were like a rocking band in LA when I was a teenager, started doing acoustic stuff Robert Hilburn was all over it. Mm-hmm. And I picked up Peter's second solo album, which is, it's got a long title, but we call it Blue Guitar for short. And it was, it was a different kind of folk music. Really, it was the prototype for Americana. It was one of the first Americana records, but it had really gritty lyrics. They weren't, it wasn't campfire music, which is one way to think about folk music. Mm -hmm. It had a grittier, I guess maybe it was more from the Woody Guthrie side of folk music than the Pete Seeger. But it was also sort of turbocharged with the way it was being, the way it was written and performed. And I listened to that record a lot. And in the summer of maybe 1989, I went to go see Peter at McCabe's, which was, was then and is now his home base. And he played solo and I just never seen anyone bring that kind of rock and roll energy to a solo performance. Mm. And I'm not talking about bashing on his guitar at all. I'm not talking about jumping up and down and yelling. I'm talking about playing quietly, but with extraordinary power or at least power that I hadn't seen before. Wow. And that, that night I was with a friend. It had the same effect on my friend where it just really, it showed me what the music that I wanted to play was. And while I didn't, Uh. you know, at the time, like, I could recognize that those are great songs, but I could in no way reproduce them. I think a lot of us have those 
experiences where we're we're hip enough to know what a good song sounds like, but not experienced enough to write a good song of our own. Right. And oh, so, wow. you know, time passed during college. This was, you know, the beginning of my call, a beginning of college for me. <laughs> and by the end of college, I had some songs, but they just weren't good. I, I knew they weren't good, but I, I was trying. Yeah. I wouldn't call myself prolific, you know, but I played sports in college. I had a lot of interests. But after college, I moved to New York to escape the life of a professional beach volleyball player, which was <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I did not know that about uh, you. Okay. You know, I could have been a decent mid-level professional beach volleyball player. Okay. But I okay. did not. And it was very easy. You can imagine how easy it would be to fall into the beach volleyball lifestyle, especially in the late eighties, okay, early nineties when it was on, and you know, on network television and, very popular. Um, you know, I, I didn't move to New York just to like escape that. I'm somewhat exaggerating. Yeah. But it did feel, there did feel like there was a dichot dichotomy in my life where there was like sort of the person I had been who played sports and did music on the side, but didn't play in bands, wasn't part of any kind of, you know, saw music and was super in, interested in music, but it wasn't my life. And one of the reasons I moved to New York was to kind of reinvent myself as the like as the person I envisioned myself being oh wow uh yeah you know, this is with the benefit of hindsight obviously but right. I, I believe there was also some foresight <laughs> you know I really right. had no plans I had no plans after you know I went to good school and people were going off to get real jobs right and and uh like I just never once considered doing that same thing going to a job interview I just right. had no plans you right know? you know well, it's interesting. One thing I just want to kind of highlight and touch on for a second, you mentioned um, this idea of, you know, the songs that are grittier and it's like less like sing along at the campfire. And I'm, I'm thinking uh, what I know about you, uh, t two things come to mind about your songs. Like, you know, you're, you're very thoughtful and I know you're philosophical. Don't you have a song about like Tolstoy or something? Yes. Yeah. And then, and also like, I'm thinking about, I think it's the opening track on this EP. Um, what's the first song on the, your EP? It's called, I often dream of candlelight Maria. Okay. I think it's this one. It's like where, where the verses are just like one note, one note, That's like, right. you know, and it's like, you get this like sense, like you really have our, our attention or you have my attention as a listener. And it's like, you're not trying to please us in the usual way. Like you're capturing us. And I feel like I, it's interesting that you were able to hone in before you were really writing tons of song on this thing that you were kind of going for. And now you do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> there's always more to do, but over 25 years of attempts, you know, I feel like I'm in a pretty good place relative yeah. to where I wanted to be yeah. as an artist. Yeah. And how do you like, what, what are, what in, what is it about putting the words together? Like what kind of drives you? Like, I, I want I want to get a song down. Like for, for I'll, I'll give an example. For me, I started writing songs because I was like emotionally and spiritually like constipated. Like I felt like I didn't have anywhere to put the things I was thinking about or feeling about. I didn't even know people who were thinking about the things I was thinking about. And this seemed like the only place for it. That was the beginning and it's not that way anymore. But so I'm just curious. So the question is kind of like, where does the compulsion come from or what drives the compulsion? Yeah. I really don't know. Okay. Okay. You know, uh, I, I really don't know. And I can tell you that I've always been moved by music and I feel its power. Yeah. And I live for those moments when I find something that speaks to me. So for example, that Peter Case record or many times over the years, you know, just to, just to name a few, Richard Buckner's album Since, which mm. is, you know, I think maybe a, at this point, a fairly obscure album, um, or the Freedy Johnson record, This Perfect World, or more recently, I love The Weatherman by Gregory Allen Isakoff. Mm. I got really obsessed with that one. The first Bonnie Vare, when Iron and Wine first started out, their second album. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like most of Iron and Wine's albums, but that one really spoke to me. And I live for those moments. And that's why yeah. I check out tons of new music. It just, uh, it doesn't always speak to me, but when it speaks to me, 
uh, I'm transported and that's an experience I want over and over again. Yeah. And yeah. there's something about that that has to do with making my own music because yeah. I get that same feeling when I'm working on something that makes sense to me. Yeah. Cool. So I might be chasing a feeling that might be the answer. <laughs> Well, and, and you're reminding me, I said this to Bob before we started, but um, I sometimes, you know, as someone who has always loved music and as a songwriter, it may sound strange to people listening that sometimes I I feel almost like I don't want to hear music anymore or like I'm so jaded that I'm just like, I just want silence. And that, that this morning, listening to Bob's EP, I had that experience of like this softening that happened, like the music really spoke to me and it sort of just completely shifted my perspective of like, I love when I hear a song where I think my day is going to go one way. And then a song is so impactful that it's like, no, actually, you know, and then I'll have kind of a different direction. Like I'm going to write a letter to so like so something will come that is um, a gift of the music. And I think that's, yeah. So thank you for that. So I want to dive into your new EP. You wrote to me, um, about, you know, you know, I, I mean, I think the process of you making this EP in these COVID times has a lot of lessons in it. So, and uh, you know, you talked about necessity being the mother of invention. So mm -hmm. can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Uh, when I made my quote comeback album in 2016 with, by the way, Peter Case producing in oh, a moment cool. of, in a moment of full circle kismet, oh, like I play wow. a really long game. From 1989 to 2016, <laughs> I was I was working my angle. <laughs> um, I play a really long game too. I, I hear you. <laughs> you know, here, well, well, you and I met. You oh know, yeah, so we should tell well, them, you know? right? Yeah, so for people summer. listening, Bob and I met at Jack Hardy's songwriting weekly uh, critique and pasta eating in New York City. What what year was that? Like ninety. Five or 96 Probably or something? Probably the mid-90s is when 97. I was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We couldn't have even guessed that we'd be doing a podcast together all these years later. No. <laughs> because podcast didn't exist. Podcast didn't even <laughs> exist. That was so fun. So <coughs> anyway. Yeah, that was so great. Um, so when I did that comeback album, that was the that was the period where empowerment started to run my empowerment as a musician started to run my life. Because I I remember talking to a publicist around the release of that album, and the publicist told me that I had to make videos because that was the coin of the realm. You get video premieres from online publications. That's the way to get your music out there in the you know 2010s. And I, I felt this sense of panic because video sounded like expensive equipment and extensive amounts of time and money associated with editing. I felt that I, I felt in that moment that I couldn't do it, but then, and this has happened to me repeatedly since then, in the 10 minutes after that call, I realized that I could easily do it basically by myself, by learning iMovie, which by the way, takes an hour max yeah. and getting my brother-in-law to come with, who's handy with a camera, you know, to come to Big Sur with me and shoot a bunch of footage for a song about Big Sur. And then I would just edit it together. I, and the publicist sent me some example videos and that yeah. was kind of the catalyst because I realized when I saw those, this wasn't Duran Duran on a sailboat. Right. You know, right. Like you can make a good video. Like the technology's there. You don't need a fancy camera. Uh, you don't need a pastel colored suit and a t-shirt. You can just do it yourself. And so that moment of realization has guided me since then and led me to the, to the, to the COVID experience where once again, there was something I thought I couldn't do, which was record at home. Right. Which again, it just seemed like, how am I gonna learn to be a recording engineer? When you watch recording engineers work, you can't know how technically proficient they are. Wait, wait they, you just, you know, you just cut out- All these million things, you, especially- You just cut out for a second. And I just wanna make sure nobody okay. misses anything. What did you say yeah. about the recording engineer? When you watch the recording engineer work, you can't believe how technically proficient they are. Yeah. And you cannot imagine being that technically proficient. And by the way, probably never will be. And then you also think in order to make, to record myself, I need to spend a million dollars on equipment and yeah. learning to use that equipment. <clears throat> because you hear people talk about it and it's a, a rabbit hole par excellence. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so one day I, so, but I, then I had all these songs piling up 
I released an album in 2019, but I've been writing a lot of songs. And as you know, when you're a songwriter and the songs pile up, you don't want to just lose them. You want to do something with them. And so I remember being at a at the early COVID, I was at a takeout restaurant. The restaurant was uh, owned by one of my son's classmates, father. And he was opening it to all the school people to get takeout like every Friday. Mm. And I ran into a, another father I know from the school, but I also know him from coaching baseball. I've known this family for a while. And we talked about music and over the course of like a 15, the, the operation was moving slowly on its first night. The, the food operation didn't have it together. And so we were standing there with our masks on for like 15 minutes, just, ch- just chatting. Yeah. And during that conversation, I became convinced that I could record myself because the guy told me, it's just not hard. I will lend you a microphone. Yeah. You know, so he lent me this microphone I'm using right now indefinitely. I went into my closet and I found a Focusrite digital interface that I purchased for some reason that was yeah. in the box unopened. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I had GarageBand. And there so, you, you know, that was all I needed to do what I do, guitar and vocals, and then fly stuff out to other musicians. There was still a test that remained. And that's, could I get good sounds? And I have not had a single complaint. And I'm working with world-class musicians on these projects. It's yeah. no joke. Yeah. And uh, no one has complained about, like, it just wasn't, it just wasn't that hard. There were hard things about it, getting yeah. the performances, the, the, actually just the same things that are always usual, hard about recording. The usual, right, exactly. Yeah. And occasionally yeah. I would delete something by accident. <laughs> like I would record over something accidentally because I was pressing the buttons myself. Yeah, I mean, that is so cool. That's why having these, <laughs> you know, obviously... COVID is not something that we wanted, but it's interesting that having this silver lining, like you would not have done that if you really weren't forced to, it sounds like, you know, like. Other- Absolutely not. And now I don't have to pay for recording studios if I don't want, which, you know, I, I want to support recording studios, but you know, right. it's a lot of, it's, you know, a thousand bucks a day or whatever, right? Uh, you know, at the, at, at the mid range. And uh, I can make as much, mu- I can kind of make as much music as I want. Yeah, if I can get a little bit of money together, like it brings the cost down, and it, I don't have to leave home. When I made Lost Soul in 2016, I went to Los Angeles for like 11 days and left yeah. my full time working wife with our two grade school age kids. Right. Yeah, which is they were super cool about it, and it right. worked out fine. It was probably <laughs> really know, fun, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't, you can't, you can only do that so many times and still be cool. Right. Well. <laughs> I can, I can relate because, well, first of all, I love being in a recording studio because I feel like it creates sort of like a special zone um, and you can come together, you know, with people you admire and you want to work with. But I, you know, I had people reach out and say, I w- actually, I was writing a song with Ethan Eubanks and Nene Camps, which is totally random and something that happened because of COVID because he posted something on Facebook like, this looks like it's going to be a long haul. Anybody up for making something? And I was like, sure. Like, I didn't know if that was going to be a poster. I mean, I just was like, I wanted the interaction. So I said, so we ended up writing a song and then we're like, well, we should record it. And I thought, well, I'd love to play piano, but it won't work, right? Like it won't work to record piano because I'm used to like playing the grand at the studio. It's got like four or five mics on it, right? And um, I just got out and they were like, well, just try it. Like, because- if we don't want to use it, we won't use it. Right. So I got out my Neumann. I opened up my bald, my upright, and I just like stuck it in there. And I, <laughs> same thing, like garage. But next thing you know, I was like, well, this isn't so bad. Like, so I'll just send the tracks and see what they think, you know, but then kind of thinking they're probably not good enough. Oh, but guess what? They were fine. You know what I mean? And now they're in the recording and it's a really nice sounding recording. Um, and the same, and then somebody else reached out, like, "Will you play piano on my record?" And I thought, "Well, no, I don't think I can, but I'll just try." You know what I mean? And then the next thing you know, it was, yeah. So I, I think that, um, yeah, there's been some inter- You know, we all know things we didn't know before. Yeah, I basically feel like I pretty much feel like I can do anything within reason. Yeah, you know, and it's like a really exciting feeling. And it makes me think of all sorts of projects, projects that I can execute, you know. And Did so you just I, send out like the song with a click and the guitar? Like, because I noticed there's drums on the record, which I would think yeah. would be the most like challenging. Or how did you approach that? So I, I have a collaborative partnership with a bass player slash producer in Los Angeles named Johnny Flower. He was in New York when we were in New York. He's a little younger than me. 
and was was playing gigs. I never I never ran ran across his path, but uh, he was hired to play on my Lost Soul album in 2016, and then we've worked together since then with him as the producer. And um, you know, one of the great by the way, here's another great advantage of COVID, if such a thing can exist. Musicians are home and available to work. Right. And so his personal network, which is extensive because he's an LA session cat, quote unquote, uh, he got Jay Bellrose to play drums. And Jay Bellrose, you know, I, I don't know if you know who that is, but he's like a, you know, probably the most prominent drummer in the Americana world. If Joe Henry makes a record, Jay Bellrose is the drummer. Yeah. On the T Bone stuff too. So like Raising Sand. No, yeah. it's like a drum. You know, if you've been around music for a while, you know you can you can work with almost any musician if you can get to them and pay them and all that. It's not like such a honor to have a fame, necessarily a famous or prominent musician on your project, but it can be challenging because of scheduling and prioritization. Right. Right. But right now, a lot there's time. There's basically there's time. How but he's on the road. Yeah. Yeah. No one's on the road. Like you're not in a studio for 12 straight hours. If you're working, you know, you're working at home on a track that takes, I don't know, depending on your, how fast you are, one to three hours or however long it takes, you know? Right. And so Johnny would take the, take the, I'd record guitar and vocal to a click. I'd send it to him. He, he did one of a, two or three things. He would either play bass on it first, or he would send it to a, uh, a guy named Dave LaVita, who was playing nylon string guitar. Mm -hmm. Dave might get it first or, uh, or Jay might get it first, but it, we'd use that core group to put together a basic track that would then go out to the background singer, Maria Taylor, uh, and or one of the other sort of colorists. Mm -hmm. We had some strings and we had a clarinet guy, we had a trumpet player, uh, but we'd put together, we just like sort of whatever, whoever was available, we'd send it to them. Right. But you, you sang together. and played first or would you then re-sing at the end? Uh, <clears throat> no, I, my intention was to play a usable, a final acoustic guitar track to a click and a scratch vocal. Mm -hmm. But typically, I would just record the final vocal and I would double it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I oh would yeah, I love that the yeah. way you produce your yeah. the way you produce your vocals is yeah. is so great. I love it. And, and then sometimes I would add my own harmonies. On this okay. is Wildland, for example, I did all the harmonies myself, and then Maria replaced left some of mine, but replaced others. Okay, um, that's the only one where I actually sang harmony. Oh no, I sang all the harmonies on the fourth song. Uh, in terms of lunar cycles, it's a lonely phase. Okay. I sang all the harmonies on that one. So I would just put together whatever I could put together. Usually it was like actually a finished product mm -hmm. with um, with that first song. So here, here's one little bump in the road. Like when you're doing like an intricate, when I'm doing an intricate finger picking song, like um, I only, like the first track, I Only Dream of Candlelight Maria, it's pretty fast and the finger picking is pretty intricate. And I was struggling to play that to a click track. Mm. The click track, I would create a kick drum I would, just, I, would, I would make a click track out of the kick drum. And mm -hmm. so it, it could be pretty loud. It wasn't just like a thin click, but it still wasn't enough for me to lock in. And so uh, once the drums were on, I replayed that guitar part. Oh, gotcha. Because I, I was just kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't sitting right in the track, but the other musicians were able to work with what I had uh -huh. and make it better. So, and then also put me in a position to do a better job. Cool. It's awesome. Well, it sounds great. I mean, you can't, it sounds it sounds fantastic. I want to, I want to kind of jump to, to the music. I don't know. Are you, are you going to play a song for us today? That's from the EP? You know, I actually wasn't going to, because uh, I have a good story around a different song, a different song. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. So um, yeah, that would be, I'd love to hear like a story and how a song came to be in a song, but I also just want to mention to people that what's so great about <laughs> Bob's new EP is that it's, it's talking about right now and like what we're going through right now. And it was so refreshing to be like, okay, like this is music that understands these current circumstances. And I, I think that's another reason it was so comforting and meaningful. Oh no. Are you frozen? You know or are you just being contemplative? <laughs> uh, you were, you were frozen for a second. Am I frozen oh, I now? was. No, 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 you're okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Frozen or contemplative, it's the question of, the, of this era. <laughs> Please write that song. <laughs> you know, yeah, that could be a funny song, actually. Uh, you know, um, I, I set out, to, the subject matter for this album did not exist in early March. I wrote the songs in March and April because I've been writing a lot of songs. And 
I wanted to go really fast and I wanted to be one of the first people to release a COVID album. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I do it on a somewhat of a shoestring budget and, and all that. And I'm, you know, never a musician's top priority. And so things got pushed off. Like, you know, the string player would be doing a video game session. We can't do you till next week, you know? Right. Uh, and so I feel like I released this album in the middle of all the COVID albums. Oh. <laughs> I feel like I, I, I didn't like, I didn't like win the first to market battle <laughs> for the COVID album. Uh, um, but, you know, the songs, only two of the songs really take, take it on super directly. In fact, three of them are fairly abstract. And, you know, ideally they they have a less of a timestamp. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. At least three of the five, maybe we'll have less of a timestamp. Although I would say to anyone considering making a COVID record now, there's not going to be a timestamp on COVID. We're not going to forget. No. You know, so music about this will continue to resonate. But, uh, you know, it can be tricky to take some of these things head on. In fact, one of the songs, the third song, it's called Now I'm in Favor of a Wall. That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Like that one, I've been, the feedback I've been, I've been getting different kinds of feedback on that song. Uh, one of the kinds is I totally don't get what you're talking about. It's super confusing. Uh, why all the irony? And the other kind of feedback I've been getting on that song is I just love what you're saying. <laughs> so that one's a little confusing. Um, you know, that's not a first in the history of my music. Yeah, um, I, I've had irony in my music from the beginning. And I've actually I'd actually kind of thought maybe I was overconfident, but I kind of thought I'd I got the irony under control so that it was always comprehensible yeah. at least. Yeah. Um, perhaps not. Uh, but that song is the one I think that sticks out as being, um, you know, maybe less of the moment than the others. Well, that, that one felt like to me, like it gave the most space. It was the most thought provoking. Cause I had to be like, Okay, like, because, you know, there's like, what does he mean? What could this mean? What is he asking us to think about? Uh, I, I just, I, I, it's the, it's the one I'm still thinking about. Like, so in that sense, it's very engaging. I'm trying to think of the specific thoughts I was having on my walk, you know, I was just thinking like, oh, like, maybe I want to have a wall between <laughs> me and these other people, but I don't, I mean, it was just like, it was pretty deep. So. Yeah. You know, I tried to play off the border wall and yeah, talk yeah. about how, you know, now we kind of, you know, some people are create, we're creating walls between us and other people. It's a somewhat complex thing to sing about. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, all right. You're going to play us a song. Sure. Okay. I want to play, I want to play a song from, my 2019 album, uh, the album's called Some of Us Are Free, Some of Us Are Lost. And the reason I, I chose this song is that I wrote it three times. Oh, interesting. Okay. I wrote this song three times and I recorded it twice. Mm. So <clears throat> I had a musical idea. I was messing around with a new tuning that I, I now use all the time. This was in the early days. I was just, just turning my, tuning my low strings down a bit to get different voicings. And I landed on a, a musical idea that was appealing to me. And I wrote a song called Altercation in the Parking Lot. And it was about when you are standing at a parking lot and some person starts honking at you and then you, because you're in the way or something. Yeah. Then, you know, it was just about like a conflict, like at Target. And I played it for people and they were like, huh, whatever. You know, it didn't seem to fit, right? The lyric didn't seem to fit the musical idea. Yeah. And so I, I just said, all right, fine. I do this all the time. I say, fine, this is not working. And I, I abandoned it. Uh, but then the musical idea stuck with me. And like six months later, I wrote it again. And this time I made it really abstract. And it was about my personal insecurities. Oh, wow. But, but, but very abstract. So I brought it into a group of songwriters. And once again, they were like, I just don't. I don't get it. Like it was abstract to the point where maybe it was incomprehensible and my okay. message was not getting across. Uh huh. Uh, and one person in the group, a guy named James Hips, who works at the, works up in Tiburon here in Northern California at the guitar shop you would go to if you had $30,000. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, he said, this sounds like a love song. Oh. And so then the next in the next two weeks, I rewrote it as a love song about the night I met my wife. Oh my gosh! 
Yeah. So that was the third version. And the th when I brought that one in, it totally clicked. And people were like, this is the song, you know, this is what it was meant to be. Those people hadn't heard all three versions. Yeah. But people had heard like one of the versions. Right. And, and when you say you brought it in, you mean to your weekly songwriting group that you do online, yep. right? Without getting, without getting too into the deal. This was before that. Oh, it was before that. Weekly, I do have a weekly online group, but this song was from a few years ago. Oh, okay. Okay. Time, I had a monthly group. Uh, okay. Ran with a woman named Rachel Garland here in San Francisco. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I have a, I, I always have a group of people around me uh -huh. to provide a deadline for my songwriting right. and also to provide constructive feedback as needed. And it's often, you know, often needed. Oh my gosh. I love um, that you rewrote this three <laughs> times. I yeah. just want to well, underline that. Like, you know, like you don't be afraid to give it another crack. And, and the other thing about it is that I recorded it twice. So when we, when we were in LA making, making this album, um, the it was towards the end of the sessions <coughs> and we were making a fairly reflective uh record with a lot of space in it i've been super influenced by joni mitchell's middle period hegira and the hissing of summer lawns and i was i was kind of doing my version of that which sounds nothing like her but has things in common if if you're if you're looking for it mm -hmm. and so instead of this song has like a uh, it has sort of a bouncy feel but the musicians I was working with decided that they wanted to record it as like sort of a space, spacey workout, spacey, you know, space epic or something. Mm -hmm. And so they recorded what I call the meditative version of it first. Mm -hmm. And it is really cool. And that actually, that song, I've never had, you know, much in the way of like um, TV placements, but just sort of somewhat by circuitous methods, it got into a Canadian TV show called Heartland. And now it's on their playlist on Spotify. It's like my number one Spotify song. Oh my gosh, that's Even amazing. Even though it's like the least commercial, you know, it's like the least, you know, it's just like a moody song that goes on in the background of something. Yeah. Uh, so that's really cool. And I'm super glad we recorded it that way with like really far out pedal steel and, you know, Casio keyboards. And like, oh, wow. You know, all sorts that's of so interesting cool. sounds. But after we finished that, everyone was kind of ready to leave. But I... I basically insisted that we record it in a more straightforward way yeah. as well. And I had had the idea of putting it on the album twice because I knew that we could do it very, very differently, 180 degrees different from how we've done it. And so we recorded this version that was also unlike anything I'd ever recorded, which has like an R and B feel with like chink, chink guitar and, uh, and like um, electric piano. So uh, there are two, I recorded two versions of it and I put them both on the album. So I wrote the song three times and I recorded it twice. And okay. so it's like my most like worked over song ever, you know? So here's my question. So do you remember the other versions? Um, I have the lyrics. I mean, cause I'm thinking, I don't know. I, I think it might be really interesting if you could <laughs> back to back play, like, you know. I, I can't, I don't have the lyrics to altercation in the parking lot okay accessible on my computer right now okay but I, okay i can why don't we um why don't i i can play a little part of it uh i can play like just the, the hook line the hook line um, of the of the target one okay yeah i can say there's an old man there's an alter altercation uh, i'm not getting it why don't I sing that part after when I... Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. I'll play um, the regular version. Okay, so cool. Sounds um, good. When you made a motion as if to leave at 11.30 on New Year's Eve, discombobulated in a flash, I knew something unexpected. I'm in love with you. In a conversation for the time it took. To debate the merits of important books. The sophistication 
of your points of view and your sense of humor. I'm in love with you. Elevated spirits and alcohol. Hush, party, or pub crawl. The makings of a good old-fashioned free-for-all. It's a long, long, long haul. From a lively dance floor to the hotel bar. And the tiny back seat of a rental car. The suburban landscape that we motored through was a ghostly vision. I'm in love with you. I remember churches and highway signs, white dresses and white lines. We can make decisions at decision time. In a long, long, long time. In the early morning, when I thought we might run away together, you caught your flight. In a daze, I wondered, could you also be in the same condition and in love with me? Wow, it's so, what a heartwarming song about falling in love with your wife. Thank you. I, I'm so proud of the lack of irony in that song. I remember having a conversation a long time ago about no-nonsense love songs. And when you start thinking about no-nonsense love songs, you realize that there aren't that many of them. And well, I suppose there's some nonsense in this song. Uh, it, it gets as close to that ideal as I've ever gotten. Yeah. I love how it's very descriptive and, you know, the suburb, you're like you're creating these pictures. So it feels like love in a real setting. You know, it's not like love as an illusion or I don't know. I just like that about it. I think that's why it lands. Um, an interesting final factoid about this song is uh, I commissioned a, I want, I've always wanted to make an animated video. <laughs> but they're quite expensive to make. And so I, but I found a, a reasonable way to do it. And I made an animated video in which I animated my wife without telling her in advance, without getting the okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then oh my God. You know, I had it, you know, I had it like premiered like in an, an online publication and just waited to see what she would, <laughs> and just waited to see what would happen. And, you know, Basically, nothing happened. It was almost as if she didn't even check it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. I really like it. It, didn't, it did not provoke the reaction I was looking for in the marital relationship. <laughs> did, did she already know about the song and just not the video or did she not yes. know about it? Okay. She, there's another song about her on the album. It's called Song for Sarah. Mm -hmm. And it's about her commute. It's a very abstract Joni Mitchell inspired rendering of her commute. Mm -hmm. And she did have a reaction to that one. She felt that some of the details were not realistic. <laughs> that, like that. <laughs> so, so maybe the fact that she said nothing about this one is actually good. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the animated video is like, to me, it just, it just cracks me up. There's this, it's really rudimentary animation. Yeah. There's this one scene where we're doing these hilarious dances. And there's one scene where she's holding up War and Peace. Uh -huh. In the song I talk about, famous books yeah and there's one she's she's uh, got holding up a copy of war and peace and like pointing at and being like trying to make a point to me yeah and it just cracks me up every time and uh you know did she not laugh i i just don't remember any getting the fireworks <laughs> i was looking for 
<laughs> Isn't that so like, that's so funny. That's so part of being a creative person is that like sometimes you're anticipating a reaction and then it's just one doesn't come. <laughs> it could be even, from the press or just listen? your, I mean, or your spouse. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Did you even listen? Like your husband, I think is he's probably still involved in making records with you, right? He is, but I mean, I feel like that happens. Like I'll send him like an email with like something that feels so important, or I'll like write him a note, or I'll link to something, and then like a month later, I'll be like, "Did you ever like get that?" And he'll be like, "No, I don't really read my email." And I'd be like, "Okay." He's like, "Well, what was it?" I'm like, "I don't know. I just think I have hurt feelings. I don't even remember now." <laughs> You can only reach Frank on TikTok. <laughs> like he's moved on from email like the young people. <laughs> sometimes I don't know if you do this, but sometimes I feel like people are like they're they're just hooked into their phones. And sometimes I just will text him even if he's in the house. I'll be like, Frank, how's it going in the <laughs> do you have some free time to see me tonight or today or whatever? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, but the um, the um... The uh, other line was the, the way I sang the original version was there, there's an altercation in the parking lot. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is a great segue because I agree with your your songwriting <laughs> feedback group that I it's much better as a love song. So um and that melody is so pretty. Da, 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 da. I love that. So can you talk a little bit about, because you and I, like we mentioned earlier, we met at Jack Hardy's songwriting group, you know, in New York City. We'd come and eat pasta and play songs. It was so fun. You had a song every week that was so well wordsmithed and I was there and there was no piano. So I would just sing acapella. <laughs> right, right. But, that's not, you know, and I feel good. like sometimes I'd play songs and people would not know what feedback to give me, but I still got a lot out of it. And you've just sort of really dutifully been doing that for many years. And I know you have a group now. Can you talk about like what that's given you and yeah, why that's meaningful? It's basically, it's, a, it's been the most important thing, if not maybe one of the top three most important things in my songwriting life for 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, when I first moved to New York, I started going to open mics just like you did. And at that time, there was the Fast Folk Cafe, which Jack Hardy had started with Wendy Beckerman and Tim Robinson and a bunch of other people. I went to the open mic. I just became friends with those people. And I found out about the Monday night songwriters meeting and started going to it and subsequently wrote a song a week with, with you know, months off for whatever, you know, trips I was doing. Uh, but, you know, for many years and that group of people became my best friends. And when I moved to San Francisco, uh, coincidentally, uh, Wendy Beckerman had also moved to the Bay Area. Mm. And so Wendy and I, this was in uh, 2000 or so, you know, uh, five years after I'd started going to Jack's meeting. And Wendy and I started a weekly meeting in San Francisco with some people we knew and some people we met. But then I moved to Iowa for five years. And I did not have a songwriters meeting in Iowa. And mm. Subsequently, my output diminished, mm -hmm. you know, dramatically because it's all about the deadline. And Jack himself, Jack is was this like great non-guru guru. He was a songwriting guru, but he didn't fancy himself that way and didn't totally. want to be that, yeah. you know. And in fact, could be rather self-destructive in that department. But. Uh, he would sometimes, he sometimes told me like, you think I have this meeting because like, I want to help everyone. He's like, no, I just need a deadline, <laughs> you know? And he was joking to an extent. He did, he did love to help people and all that. But like, yeah. you know, uh, if you have a deadline, this is my experience, but I happen to believe that it can be everyone's experience. I, I, I believe it rather bullheadedly that if you set a deadline for yourself, you can write as many songs as you want. I have never tested the daily deadline I, a week, you know, is a good amount of time for me to come up with an idea, ruminate on it a bit, wrestle with it and polish it. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do that in three days sometimes, but sometimes last week, for example, it took me six days. Right. But I feel like a week is a reasonable <clears throat> amount of time if you know the deadline's coming and if you can figure out ways to write in the margins of your day. If you can have an always on, for me, it has to be always on. 
Tim Robinson, who I mentioned before, will have a meeting on a Monday night and he'll send me a new song by 10 o'clock the next morning. Mm. I wish he wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, could you just save this in your drafts and like for I mean, a couple of days? <laughs> I, 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 you know, like, I, I've written like something like 55 songs this year, you know, already. And like, for me, that, that's probably the most songs I've ever written in a year. I'm going to get to 60 something because I'm writing every week, but like, I can't go from 9 p.m. to 10 a.m. and like write a fully developed song. So it kind of yeah. pisses me off slash yeah. makes me feel insecure. But anyway, um, so I've throughout my, so Wendy and I started a meeting in San Francisco that met weekly. I went to Iowa. I came back to San Francisco and the meeting had shifted to monthly. Okay. And so I started going to that. This was when my kids were young and I was kind of like, I'd quit music. I had, yeah. I was a brand manager for Glad Plastic Containers at the Clorox company. Wow. Like I was just, okay. I was out of, I was out of it, you know? Okay. But I, I got back into it when my younger son was like two, I was like, all right, I got to get back to songwriting. It had been a year. I, there was one year where I really didn't write any songs and I wasn't doing any gigs. I was doing maybe one gig. So I went back to this meeting and sort of got back on it, uh, made the record with Peter Case uh, and started a second meeting in San Francisco with my good friend, mm -hmm. Rachel Garland. Mm -hmm. you, did you know Rachel in New York? I, I, I know her like barely, but yeah. Yeah, she's, she's the greatest, super yeah. great songwriter, a wonderful person. And she wanted to have a meeting at her house, which is super near my house. And so we did that. So I had two meetings going at the same time mm -hmm. and I would stagger them. So you see, I was adding additional artificial deadlines. Yeah. And then when COVID hit and we couldn't meet in person, I had another moment of empowerment where I was like, wait a second, you know, I can have whatever songwriters meeting I want. Right. And, you know, um, there, it's really hard for people to follow this routine sometimes. Yeah. And so in the meeting we had that Wendy was kind of in charge of in the East Bay and the meeting that Rachel and I were doing, I never, you know, I'm, I, I can be a little bit of a hard ass about the process. Like I really wanted people who were going to come every time. Mm -hmm. If they didn't have a song, I still wanted them to come to be yeah. part of the process. Totally. You know? Uh, because that's what it's all about. It's it's less about getting feedback on your songs and more about getting to know the songs of others and helping them develop. Like that's what your real duty is totally. to the group. Totally. And I would get frustrated because people weren't as into songwriting as I am. I'm like super, super into songwriting and it's yeah. like all I care about besides yeah. coaching my kids' baseball team, you know? Yeah. So um, what I did was I just made a meeting of people that I knew that would be super into it. Yeah. You know? So smart. And, uh, a lot of those people are from the Hardy meeting. Tim Robinson is one. Uh, Jim Allen is another. I don't know if you remember Jim, but the deep, deep voice. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, David Hamburger is in the group. Remember okay. David Hamburger, the Dobro player, who's also okay. a great yep. songwriter. Yep. Uh, and like Libby Kirkpatrick in Vermont, and yeah. Hope Dunbar in Nebraska. Oh, and Hope, Dunbar's okay. a new friend. You know, okay. I met her through Folk Alliance. At Folk Alliance. So when I started right. going back to that. Right. And uh, I don't know if you remember Django Haskins. Uh, who was a great songwriter who now who was in New York with us and now lives in North Carolina. Uh, okay. Byron Isaacs, the bass player. Okay. He, will, he plays bass in the Lumineers, but he's also got a songwriting duo called the Lost Leaders. Nice. So I just gathered all these people I thought would be it. Brian Joseph from LA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, Christopher Smith from San Anselmo. So basically I gathered this group of people that I thought would be into it. And now we have a weekly meeting on Zoom and it's you know, everything I could ever want in a songwriter's meeting. Oh, I love it. Uh, Wendy Beckerman's in it. Louise Taylor's in it. It's pretty big, actually. <laughs> and does everybody come every time? Or is if at least like 60% of people come, it sounds like it would be pretty full. Uh, yeah, we had, there were two people that kind of dropped out because they weren't, the timing wasn't right for them to be fully committed. Right. But everyone else, uh, everyone else comes every week unless they have like, a, you know, someone's got a kid birthday tonight, so they can't come. But that's, it's a very committed group. And that's, that's really what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Uh I had a group Everyone's like really that in, each um, other's work. I had, we were living in Ann Arbor for a while and there was, a, I don't know what it is about Mondays, but we, we were doing a, a, a Monday night group there. And I loved, I mean, I loved going, it's not like I had a song every time, but I loved going and hearing people's songs. And I mean, it's amazing what the group think can do, you know, or when you get the same feedback from like three or four people and yeah, the power of the deadline is huge. I feel like there's some things that I make that want to be born that don't respond to a deadline, but I can always write something on a deadline. And so um, 
like that song I mentioned earlier with Ethan and Nini that I recently wrote, literally every time I was supposed to meet with them to write, I didn't want to. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, it was, I mean, there's nothing about them or, or even about the top, like the topic of the song. It was just like some sort of resistance, but knowing that they were expecting me at 9 a.m. was like, I'm going to be there. And then, you know, by the end, we're like, you know, each writing a verse, you know, and then suddenly you have a song, but I, you know. I really I think mean, that's the key to the whole thing. It's, you know, some people talk about, people talk about um, waiting for, you know, to, the, the moment of inspiration. Yeah. And I agree that the, you have to have an idea. You know, that the inspiration has to hit at some point, but I believe you can court inspiration. Oh, totally. And you can, you know, and you can be, you can like demand inspiration almost, yeah. you know? Yeah. You create, you create space for it to come. You like set the table or. <laughs> Jack, Jack one time was like super all over Suzanne Vega for not writing enough songs. <laughs> And he's like, you don't have your antenna up all the time. And I mean, she, she like remembered that and would fr occasionally frustratedly say, oh, I guess I don't have my antenna up, you know, right now. But like, that was an important, I mean, you know, yeah. Suzanne Vega is uh, unimpeachable when it comes yeah. to songwriting. She right. has her own process, you know. Right. Uh, and it, it's not like super speedy, write songs every day. <clears throat> She's quite ruminative. But Jack was trying to tell her like, you know, get ready. You can have it whenever you want. You can have it whenever you want. It's so funny because I, you know, we were scheduled to talk today and I'm actually not at home. I live in Milwaukee. I'm actually at my parents' house and I was walking in my mom's room this morning and I found this Suzanne Vega book that apparently my mom is reading. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Called The Passionate Eye and the collected writing of Suzanne Vega. And I was like, I can't believe I'm I haven't seen this book and I don't even know. And I'm talking to Bob today. So that's in the nineties, she was using that book in her shows. She would read from it. There's little stories in there. And the mm -hmm. she, she used to love to read this. She would read this story about uh, when she was a kid and the audience would love it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. I want to ask you, I want to ask you one quick question and then one final thing before, cause we're get, heading up on an hour now. I, I just want to, do you have any awareness around your wordsmithing or your approach to lyric writing? Because I just love it. And um, I don't know. Do, are you, do you I, like, are you conscious of it or is it an unconscious? I am, I am, I am very, very conscious of it. Okay. So <laughs> over the, you know, starting with that, my, the, the beginning of my aesthetic probably was hearing that Peter Case record in 1989, the way he put words together the way he sometimes had fun with words, um, all that started me on a, a sort of a path. And, you know, every songwriter worth their salt, like has, has sort of a recognizable aesthetic, a way they like to fit words together. And I have my way, like I wrestle with lines until they sound right to me. And sometimes, you know, I, I remember in college reading reading like Joyce and hearing a teacher would say like, and James Joyce would wrestle with one line for the, you know, he would like worry about one word for a week. And that was obviously at that time incomprehensible to me, but I, I kind of understand, I'm not comparing myself with James Joyce, but I do now understand this right. notion of wrestling with something. And it might be a matter of a uh versus the, it could be as simple as should I use a uh here or should I use the here? But I, I care a lot about every word and how it sounds. I don't always nail it. And in fact, the hardest songs to the right are the ones where I've somewhat painted myself into a musical corner where the words have to hit certain, certain marks. And it's just like impossible to express an idea clearly. I, I'm just like, I struggle to express the idea clearly within that context I've set for myself. Yeah. But I wrestle with it and I wrestle with it and I really am not comfortable presenting it to anyone until it sounds like I want it to sound. Yeah, cool. Well, I just want to highlight that because as you know, you know, this podcast is for people who love music and love songs, but it's, um, it's for makers and songwriters. And so just highlighting the, the fact that you stay open to how could this be better? Or how can this more hit the mark? You know, it's not just because it's down, you keep it. So I, I sense that. And there's like a nap. <laughs> there's a naturalness to the words. Like it never feels like you're rhyming for the sake of rhyming. And it always feels like the idea is primary, but there's a way that, you know, I don't feel like you jammed in a bunch of syllables on a lot. It just feels very, it feels 
as a songwriter, I can, I feel like you sat with it, but it sounds very natural. Like you didn't right. uh, over labor it, if that makes I sense. I mean, some, some people can, some people can just spit it out and it sounds beautiful. I'm not one of those people. I have to work hard to make it sound right. Quote yeah. unquote, right. Um, but I really believe more than anything in making it sound right. Yeah. And I, I object to songwriters who don't go back and clean things up a bit. Yeah. I, I, I come across that in some of the songwriting students I've come across, like they're just, there's a resistance to like, but I wrote it this way, you know, and you're like, okay, you can keep, you can keep it that way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, last thing is what, if you, you've given a lot of great advice today. Um, if you could only share one thing with other songwriters, poets, makers, uh, creative folks out there, um, what would it be? I'm going to share two things. Okay. Despite the instructions, <laughs> I'm an iconoclast uh, because one we've already talked about. Uh, my advice to anyone would be you can write more songs and you can write better songs. If you think you need to wait for inspiration, you're wrong. You can demand inspiration. And if you think you have your songs together, which we all do, basically in the present, we feel like we have our songs together, but I would argue that we never do to the extent that we can. And so I have these groups to remind me of that, to show me things that I haven't thought of myself and to remind me when I, there's something I think is together, but isn't together. I was just listening to a bunch of my songs for a project I have in mind. And there were some that at the time I wrote them, I thought were really happening. And now I have problems with them. So I, I constantly realize that things could be better. And, you know, I would hope that all songwriters would constantly strive to write more and better. And the second thing is uh, like reading and writing. I would encourage, I would encourage any, any person who deals in words to read a lot. Um, and you do it for two reasons. One is the perspective that you get, because we only have our own perspective. But if you read fiction, you can get the perspective of others. And that song of mine, Tolstoy, you mentioned early in the interview, is, is about basically how Tolstoy seemed to know everything about everyone. Like there could be a 13-year-old debutante or like a, a middle-aged peasant. And he seemed to be able to get into their heads just as effectively. I mean, not that I know what's in their heads, but it seemed right to me. Uh, if you read fiction, you can experience other perspectives, but perhaps more importantly, you get new ideas about use of language. And so if you read, I, I, don't, I don't read poetry and I, you know, I don't necessarily recommend it to anyone. It's, it's too hard for me, but I, you know, I do read, I have always read a lot of fiction. And if you go from, well, you know, you're like your Raymond Carver type, who's really spare to your like Gabriel Garcia type, who's like really lyrical, everything in between that is game. And you can figure out ways to write differently based simply on reading or listening to other music. Some of my favorite moments in my musical career is when a song has shown me a different way to write songs. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like when I first, uh, uh, Dan Byrne. That's oh, Dan I was who, just going to mention him. Oh yeah. my gosh. Okay. That's who you and I opened for at Martyrs in Chicago that night when we last saw each other. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember I'd never heard of him. I was at the Rocky Mountain Folks Festival and he was in the middle of the day on Saturday or something. He played this song, Too Late to Die Young. And the first line was, oh, yeah. the day that Elvis died was a mercy killing. Like I could not believe that was in a, like, it just was a whole other. And I heard, I heard that song. And I heard a few other songs that he played that weekend. And it just opened my eyes to like a whole different way of thinking about song. And that's happened to me, you know, five times. Yeah, you know, it's funny that, you know, you're talking about reading fiction um, for two reasons, you know, learning about other perspectives, and then also use of language. There's something it reminds me of this thing that I used to do when I would get stuck with a song, like I have this song about New York and Chicago, you probably don't know it. But I remember like, not I wasn't sure how to like I knew what I wanted to say, but I just didn't know how to approach it structurally. And but I immediately thought, well, what would Dan Byrne do? Like, oh. how, like, how would he write this song? Because that's kind of the type of song I want to write, that it will be funny, but not in a ha-ha way. 
Um, and, and that was like my key. And I've done that over the years. I'll, you know, if I get stuck with something, I, I'd be like, who knows how to write this song? Like what artist? like Bob Hillman, you know, uh, Sarah McLaughlin, you know, and I'll sort of try to like channel, um, almost like their awareness or their perspective, um, or their way of using language or melody. And, you know, it's just a little magic trick that that seems to work, even it's if it's great, like just a working for tool me. Tool or you know, even tr even trick, like yeah, you know, like the the Brian Eno cards. Yeah, yeah, I the, forget the, what they're called. Yeah, the, oh, the product. You know about the cards? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, you know, I have a I have the app on my phone. And I I never use it, but I think about it a lot. Like sometimes you just need like um, you just described something that could be in one of those cards. It could be like, what would Dan Byrne do? Or you know, for me, I sometimes yes. say, what would Joni Mitchell do? Yes. Lately, you know, for the last five years, what would you, and like, it can get you going. It gets you out of your own thing, but it's not copying. It's just jarring. Exactly. Exactly. In fact, I think I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I forgot about it. I forgot about it. So we were talking. This is great. That's why it's going to yeah. talk to people. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for chatting and for being here today and sharing your, your experience and your beautiful music. That's Totally my pleasure. Um, we're in the podcast era and I love doing podcasts and especially when I can talk about things that deeply interest me Yeah, uh, like this. Yeah. And we can kind of meander a little bit. Okay. We'll check out Bob's music and um, thank you so much for, for being here until next time. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much for joining us. If you know someone who would enjoy or benefit from this podcast, please share it with them. Thanks so much. Much love.